Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Sriram Kulkarni. I am here uh, to present uh, uh, some of the advanced seawater desalination technologies, especially the larger projects that have been executed by our principals IDE technologies from Israel. Uh, they are one of the leaders, global leaders in seawater desalination and some of the largest projects have all been uh, completed by them here in India using all the three advanced desalination technologies. So I'll quickly run through it. I understand there's a shortage of time so some of the slides I may just skip through so please bear with me but uh, at any time you know if you have any questions I'll be happy to answer them you know sometime during the day. Uh, basically the need for seawater desalination is already uh, talked about. Uh, over a period of time the demand for water continues to grow. We have limited resources of fresh water and you have to identify new ways of getting this fresh water. So one way is to duplicate the nature. If you look at the nature basically it takes seawater, it evaporates, makes it into cloud and then uh, rain happens and you get fresh water. So desalination is basically trying to emulate the same thing, taking seawater and producing fresh water. So this basically, you know, almost 97% uh, of uh, the water resources lie in the sea. Uh, unfortunately, it is saline in nature. Now to get fresh water back, the only option left is uh, for seawater desalination technologies. As far as our principles, ID is concerned, they are one of the global leaders in uh, EPC projects and uh, some of their technologies uh, provide you know, lowest cost uh, desalination plants. Uh, they have expertise for uh, some of the world's largest, most complicated uh, uh, desalination projects. And they have a proven track record of more than, more than 400 uh, projects in 40 countries over the last four to five decades. If you look at uh, the three advanced desalination technologies that are currently available on large scale desalination, uh, the first one is called as mechanical vapor compression. It's a thermal desalination technology uh, that utilizes electrical power as the source of energy for desalination process. Uh, please keep in mind that any desalination process does require energy, some source of energy or in order for you to remove the salts from the uh, salted water or saline water. The second technology is called as multiple effect distillation technology, which is a more refined process uh, uh, over the multi-stage flash. Uh, practically multi-stage flash is an outdated technology today. Most of the projects have been switched over to uh, multiple effect distillation because it's a low temperature distillation process and it provides several advantages which I'll very quickly run through. The last technology is a membrane technology which is reverse osmosis which already you know has been discussed earlier. Again you are basically uh, removing uh, salts down to the ionic levels through a filtration mechanism and as far as uh, low temperature distillation technology is concerned uh, there are a few uh, criteria that uh, uh, play a role. One is it is operating at low temperatures of less than 72 degrees. Uh, you can use waste heat or low grade heat that is available from industrial sources. Number of power plants, refineries, they do have uh, low grade heat available uh, which they don't have any use for and such heat if it is available then it can be used. A nuclear uh, energy also is one such example which already has been discussed. So nuclear energy uh, if it is available at uh, low grade then that can be utilized. Uh, Again, there are some advantages of operating at lower temperature, which uh, we'll very quickly run through. Uh, if you look at this particular slide, this basically talks about the, you know, I, I'm going to basically focus only on seawater desalination. Uh, today's uh, workshop is on all sorts of desalination, which includes seawater, brackish water, uh, recycle, reuse of uh, effluents. But uh, my uh, talk is going to be specifically on seawater desalination. So this uh, basically is the chemistry of the uh, seawater. And uh, basically on the x-axis you are plotting the temperature. On the y-axis you are plotting the uh, concentration of uh, total dissolved solids in the uh, sea water. So as you are desalinating this concentration keeps going up in the brine itself. And uh, when you plot this you basically come to a green zone uh, which is called as a metastable zone. 
this particular metastable zone is where you have uncontrolled precipitation of salts taking place in the form of calcium sulfates, magnesium sulfates, you have bicarbonates, all of them they start precipitating out. So uh, the idea of uh, any kind of desalination process is to stay out of this particular zone. And in case of thermal uh, technology, you see that blue zone, uh, which is the safe zone in which both MVC and MED technologies are operating. Uh, this particular uh, schematic is of uh, a technology called mechanical vapor compression. Uh, it's uh, basically uh, probably one of the most thermodynamically uh, efficient uh, thermal desalination technologies. And uh, here you are basically uh, simulating nature. Uh, on one side you have uh, hot seawater which is falling in a, uh, on the shell side of a sh uh, uh, shell and tube heat exchanger. And as air flows through it, it picks up moisture. This moisture as it gets saturated, uh, gets collected through the compressor and it gets pushed inside the tubes. And uh, because we are operating at a perfect thermodynamic equilibrium, a slight increase in pressure uh, results in condensation. Once it condenses, it releases latent heat. This latent heat further goes out on the shell side, evaporates more of the seawater. So this is the whole process. Um, because of shortage of time, I am unable to go through the detailed process. I'll be happy on a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, to uh, discuss and present it. Uh, so this technology is called as mechanical vapor compression system, and there are hundreds of, you know plants that have been built worldwide using this technology. It's uh, probably about uh, four to five decades old technology, a uh, very well proven technology. Uh, this is just a very quick, uh, you know, uh, animation of how exactly the system works. And uh, again, I will not uh, really go into the explanation. Uh, these are a couple of units. You can see these are nice skid mounted systems. You don't need any building or anything. Each one has a capacity of about 1.2 million liters per day. These have been installed since 1990 and operating. Uh, as uh, Dr. Tiwari ji mentioned, uh, the thermal desalination processes are fairly robust in terms of treating uh, contaminated you know, uh, seawater sources. And uh, typically, we don't need any pretreatment. So seawater comes in directly into these kind of uh, units and they get treated. Uh, these are uh, also among the world's largest uh, MVC units operating in Italy since 1999. These are also uh, the world's largest uh, MVC units that have been installed in NPCIL Kudin Kulam. They have been operating since 2006. Uh, we hopefully uh, are expecting to get another set of four more units of uh, 3,000 cubic meter per day, which will be the world's largest again uh, for the, their second phase expansion at NPCIL Kudin Kulam. We're going to the next technology, which is multiple. Yes. <coughs> Basically, in a MVC plant, uh, you are, uh, you know, having a limitation of the compressor itself. Uh, these are among the world's largest compressors that are taking air from one side of the MVC unit and then pumping it uh, throughout the system. And we are operating at very low uh, pressures because we are evaporating at less than 72 degrees. Uh, we are maintaining a pressure of about 0.1 to 0.15 watt pressure inside. So. Um, there's a limitation on the size of compressor that is used to pull the air from one side and recirculate it within the system. So the, you know that's why there's a limit of uh, the capacity of the MVC units. Uh, 3,000 cubic meters per day is the largest you know uh, MVC unit that has ever been built in the world. Uh, this is a multiple effect distillation technology. Uh, basically, there are a number of effects uh, which in improve the efficiency in terms of uh, steam economy as uh, we already heard earlier. Again, I won't go into the details of the process itself. Uh, these are uh, four uh, units that have been built in Reliance uh, with the capacity. Oh, I'm sorry, this particular slide is wrong. This per these are units that have been built in SR Oil in Wadinar with a capacity of 65 MLD. Uh, there were two uh, projects in 2004 and 2012 uh, for uh, SR Oil in Gujarat, uh, Wadinar, Gujarat, which is right next to Jamnagar itself. 
these are nine units of uh, med uh, as well as mvc that are operating since 1981 uh, 1981 basically means it's more than 35 years now and these plants continue to operate without having any problems in terms of efficiency in terms of performance in terms of productivity and uh, so this is you know uh, something which is unique about uh, thermal desalination uh, uh, processes where they are designed on a long-term basis and they continue to operate as long as you know uh, it's properly designed these are a couple units of 20,000 uh, operating in Spain. Uh, you can see there's an intake which is uh, located uh, within 50 meters uh, of the plant itself. And there is no pretreatment. The seawater comes directly to the thermal desalination units. Uh, there's a power plant behind uh, which is supplying low-grade steam uh, from the power plant itself, which is waste steam that is available. Now, uh, in Reliance Jamnagar, uh, they have a total installed capacity of 230 million liters per day. This is probably one of the world's largest single location of MED installation. And uh, there have been, uh, there are total 12 MED units, which have been a part of three projects, three of their projects, the first refinery, the second uh, SEZ refinery, and the latest J3 project. And uh, we have been part of those uh, in uh, you know all the three projects. So total cap installed capacity is 230 MLD. These are uh, some of the uh, recent ones that have been supplied. Uh, each one having a capacity of 24 million liters per day. So, uh, Dr. Swaminathan, you are right. You know, it's order of magnitude difference from 3,000 all the way to 24,000 in terms of you know the uh, largest uh, MVC units versus MED units. Yes. This is multiple effect distillation technology. Uh, in a multiple effect distillation technology, we are using steam as the energy source. And this per, all we are doing is taking the latent heat from the steam. And this latent heat travels from one effect to the second effect to the third effect. And in each effect, basically, it is uh, doing the desalination process. Again, uh, I'm not able to explain the technology because of time. But uh, I'll be happy you know, to discuss further or maybe I can come down again for the benefit of the students and faculty to uh, present the process itself. But it's very similar to a multiple effect evaporator. I'm sure uh, in the chemical engineering department, you must have you know, studied the multiple effect evaporator technology. So, But these are all a multiple effect distillation technology. And they're all operating at under vacuum of 0.1 to 0.15 ATA pressure. And uh, typically, they are operating at less than 72 degrees. Uh, there is an advantage uh, of 72 degrees because one, uh, there is less amount of precipitation of salts that takes place. So scaling is significantly reduced once you go down to less than 72 degrees. Second is the materials of construction that can be used below 72 degrees uh, because seawater is highly corrosive in nature. The moment you have higher temperature, the corrosivity also increases. So the moment you go down to low temperature distillation process, you can use more economical materials of construction. For example, IDE is using a special grade of aluminum alloy. So you don't need to go to titanium tubes. You know, uh, low aluminum alloy is good enough for the tubes. The shell itself, you don't need to go to a duplex stainless steel. Uh, we are using basically carbon steel with special epoxy coating. They, they do have a proprietary epoxy coating technology. Uh, they cover, you know, three layers of 50 micron uh, epoxy uh, in, inside. And uh, we have plants in Reliance, for example, that are operating since 1998. And you open the uh, units inside, it looks absolutely brand new. There is no corrosion, absolutely nothing at all. Uh, also, uh, part of the pretreatment plays a role. Uh, in thermal desalination technologies, one of the things that uh, we are doing is taking out all the uh, dissolved oxygen. The moment you remove dissolved oxygen to less than uh, 10 parts per billion levels, immediately that seawater becomes less corrosive in nature. So even some of the uh, pumps and materials of construction of equipment that are used, we don't need to go to a duplex stainless steel. Normal 316 stainless steel is good enough. The moment the oxygen is removed, immediately it becomes less corrosive in nature. Um, reverse osmosis process, uh, I won't again go into the details. Uh, basically, uh, osmosis is a natural process where uh, there is a natural flow of water. And this uh, flow of water takes place from uh, uh, low 
uh, I'm sorry, from a concentrated uh, solution side, I'm sorry, from a diluted solution side to a concentrated solution side. Now, when you reverse this particular thing using energy, it's called reverse osmosis process. You can see a reverse osmosis process typically is uh, uh, consisting of multiple unit processes. Uh, typically, you do need uh, extensive pretreatment that takes care of uh, any of the contaminants which are present in the seawater. Especially along this Indian coastline, you find that there is a lot of contamination in the form of suspended solids, in the form of organics, a lot of sewage is flowing into the sea, a lot of uh, uh, industrial effluents are flowing into the sea, so you need extensive pretreatment. We just completed uh, uh, a project for Reliance in Jamnagar with 170 million liters per day. SWRO, which is India's largest SWRO project. And over there, uh, we have used the pretreatment consisting of coagulation, flocculation, inclined plate clarification, dissolved air flotation. We have a, a sand media filtration followed by ultrafiltration. Only after the ultrafiltration process, uh, the water is fit enough for it to go to uh, the membranes, the reverse osmosis membranes. And uh, basically, in case of uh, reverse osmosis technology, they are measuring the inlet quality in the form of SDI, which is a silt density index. So even, for example, the bottled water, which looks absolutely clear, may not be fit enough for uh, the reverse osmosis process itself in terms of uh, the feed to the reverse osmosis. Also, uh, there is post-treatment that is required typically in uh, uh, reverse osmosis process. First of all, there is a very low LSI that is generated, which become, makes the uh, product water corrosive. So you need to add a little amount of uh, calcium, magnesium salts. Uh, the pH levels are lower, so you need to add the pH as well in order to make it portable and uh, circulating. So there, there is a you know, lot of functional blocks starting from intake. Uh, in case of RO, you no want to make sure that you go as deep into the sea to get as clean of a seawater as possible. Normally along the coastline, you find that the, there is a lot of contamination. Uh, basically, whatever contaminants are being thrown into the sea, they're all accumulated within the coastline. So typical intake is about one to one and a half kilometers deep inside, as compared to the picture that we saw of MED, which is only 50 meters away. So this is a big difference. Uh, there's a huge pretreatment that is required in case of a reverse osmosis system, uh, you have a reverse osmosis plant itself, there's post-treatment, and finally the product delivery system. This is among the world's largest SWRO plants operating with a capacity of almost about 500 MLD in Israel. It's at a location called Hadera. Uh, I'll just very quickly go through the functional blocks. There's a pre-treatment SWRO building. There's a second stage backish water RO. Uh, because they do have, uh, uh, they did have a requirement for re further reduced uh, total dissolved solids. Normally, uh, the seawater has a dissolved solid level of about 40,000 ppm. The moment you go through one stage of SWRO, it comes down to around 400 ppm. Now, if you want to reduce that 400 ppm further down to, let's say, 100 ppm or so, uh, which is typically, you know, the case in ca uh, case of river water or something that you are currently drinking, then you need to have a second stage brackish water RO. You have post-treatment, you have product water tank. So that's the whole system. We'll very quickly run through some of the experiences in India over the last 30 years where uh, there have been limitations, difficulties experienced on seawater desalination projects. The first, uh, uh, you know, uh, difficulty that existed was early failures of SWRO membranes, uh, primarily because uh, at that time uh, the people who installed these RO plants didn't understand the seawater chemistry. Uh, they did not understand that there's a lot of contamination in the seawater especially along the Indian coastlines. There was a lot of suspended solids, oil and grease, dissolved or organics. There was pro improper you know, uh, pre-treatment process selected and many earlier projects uh, in the 80s, they started failing. So there was, there's a perception not to go for desalination in those times. Second is a high perceived cost of seawater desalination. Now, anything will cost more than the free source of water that is made available by nature. River, you know, basically rain happens and that water is made available to you free of cost. There is a cost associated with energy that we invest in seawater desalination. So people started saying that, okay, desalinated water is more expensive, so let's not go for desalinated water. But if you really look at, you know, the market cost of water, 
and uh, you know what people are willing to pay the industries are willing to pay then you find that desalinated water th that is existing does have a cost associated to it uh, today we have been pampered uh, by the government and also our own uh, cultural you know beliefs that uh, water and air is god given gift so we should enjoy it free but really there is a cost that uh, needs to be paid we have uh, a responsibility these are very valuable resources that have been given to us and once you assign a free value to it then you start misusing these resources and that is what is happening i mean many of our fresh water resources have been destroyed basically because of humans they feel that this is a free resource so we don't care about it uh, third thing is lack of easy access to seawater data at that time uh, there were data that were generated by a few organizations like niot we do have a gentleman here from niot uh, but uh, the, those data were not easily available not made easily available so this is another uh, thing where every project required specific studies to be done and uh, uh, you know uh, to in order for you to design the plant effectively uh, another uh, limitation is absence of a national policy towards implementation of seawater desalination projects and this is one of the recommendations that i would like to make this particular workshop to you know maybe put it forward to you know the authorities that uh, they need to develop some sort of a, a national policy for seawater desalination projects across india i know there is a lot of talk being taken place by many of the uh, you know senior ministers that they want to set up uh, desalination plants along the coastline but there is no clear thought there is no clear vision there is no clear idea how to go ahead and do it um also uh, you know th there is uh, as i mentioned the thermal desalination is uh, uh, can utilize a lot of waste heat um uh, and uh, if you look at uh, many of the industries which are existing across india especially the power plants there is waste heat or seemingly waste heat that is available that can be utilized uh, if you look at a power plant in a power cycle uh, uh steam is uh, produced it goes through a turbine and uh, then low pressure steam goes to a condenser in the condenser almost about 60% of the energy is wasted now somehow if we can make use of the 60% energy uh, i think you know the, you can uh, uh, improve uh, from a national perspective utilization of your energy resources 60% wastage is basically in my opinion uh, you know uh, a criminal offense and uh, there should be some way where uh, policies can be set up for cogeneration of seawater desalination with uh, electrical power plants uh, our uh, friend from niot will be talking about some way where waste heat is being utilized so we hopefully will have uh, one you know uh, uh, paper that will be discussing that i hope so i think uh, you are doing a project for uh, a tneb in tuticorin uh, where such kind of waste heat is available but again you know uh, the, if you look at back pressure steam itself uh, from a turbine those can be utilized in terms of cogeneration i'll very quickly run through uh, back pressure steam uh, from a steam turbine can be utilized for operating med units if you look at a 800 megawatt supercritical turbine the potential exists for almost about 370 mld of med water Uh, just from the amount of steam that is being utilized now this particular thing uh, can be very use you know uh, something important and there is a uh, economic uh, model uh, i will not go through the details but you know it's right in front of you that uh, you, you know if every power project that is coming up on the coastline is forced to implement a desalination plant as part of their csr activity and supply water to the neighborhood i think it can solve a lot of problems of india uh med uh, units can be operated from hot water from the condenser i think that's precisely the project that is being done by niot currently at tneb uh, you can have uh, uh, waste heat from gas turbines that can be utilized you have uh, back pressure from a combined cycle can be utilized these are a few projects where such kind of uh, uh, waste heat is being utilized even in reliance also from their power plant back pressure steam uh, at very low pressure at 0.5 watt pressure is being provided to our units and we are operating the med units uh, this particular project we already uh, saw it in earlier slide you can now see the picture of the power plant right behind and these are the 20 mld or 17.5 mld units you can also have a you know waste heat uh, from diesel engine 
uh, because you uh, diesel engine does produce uh, waste gases they have a hot water cycle all of it can be utilized the hot water can be flashed and the steam uh, low, low grade steam can be uh, sent in terms of steam requirement for a med all we need is 72 degree steam 72 degree vapor which is 0.32 ATA it's vacuum grade vapor that is good enough for operating a MED plant uh, lack of industry and government funded research to develop state of the art seawater desalination projects uh, is another reason for limitations and difficulties experienced even today number of tenders are coming out but they are not moving forward there are very few tenders on the government side that have really gone ahead I mean we only have two projects uh, in Chennai for seawater desalination that have actually been uh, implemented each one of 100 MLD but there is need in various other parts I mean India has a huge coast line and a uh, number of other desalination plants can be set up organizations like IIT Gandhinagar can be utilized many other research institutes uh, we have uh, one of the uh, research institutes from Gujarat the Central Marine Research Institute I think all of these can be effectively combined and uh, uh, you know uh, technologies can be developed here in India for proper uh, implementation of projects lack of funding financial participation payment guarantee mechanisms is another reasons why many of the large tenders have failed uh, even today here in Gujarat there have been several tenders that have come out but uh, there is no guarantee mechanism I mean you know you come out with a tender people participate in the tender at the end of the day the financial institutions they want to make sure that there is a bankable guarantee that is given by the uh, a client institution and that uh, mechanism is not properly understood maybe by the Indian government it's not uh, so a lot of large projects are failing improper planning of tenders many of the tenders are done haphazardly without enough data the moment you have less amount of data given to a, a technology provider he is going to cover his risks by uh, increasing the cost so you know uh, improper planning of tenders again results in failure uh, because larger price of you know projects are coming in uh, lastly there is a move now going to water sale and municipal water supply in the form of build on operate projects so in a build on operate projects you have basically a, a boot project and then you have multiple uh, players which includes the sponsors that basically provide the financing you have the suppliers that provide the uh, equipment you have EPC contractors that execute the project yeah this is the last slide uh, you have customers that have to have offtake agreements you have consultants lenders and finally an operations and maintenance uh, equipment these are a few of these boot projects this is a 65 MLD project in Larnaca of SWRO uh, this is uh, a 390 MLD project of Ashkelon in Israel uh, 440 MLD in Hadera, Israel. This is a project which is already up and operating. This is an older slide, 550 MLD in Sorek, Israel. So thank you once again. I really appreciate the opportunity. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to address you know uh, later on or any time that uh, is convenient. So thank you.